All right. So thank you all so much for coming today. Welcome to today's webinar. It is a Q&A with Dr. Cora Taylor. She will be addressing behavioral interventions for the Simon Searchlight community. My name is Gabby Burkholtz. I am the Simon Searchlight Research Outreach Coordinator, and I will be hosting the session this afternoon. You should be able to see and hear me on your screen. Although I won't be able to see or hear you, we're hoping that this session can be interactive. We welcome you to ask questions in the Zoom Q&A box, and we encourage everyone to avoid including personal health information, aka PHI, for your own privacy. <clears throat> so here with me is Dr. Cora Taylor. Dr. Taylor is an assistant professor and clinical psychologist at Geisinger Autism and Developmental Medicine Institute in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, and is a principal investigator for Simon Searchlight. Dr. Taylor completed her graduate training at the University of Tennessee and a research and clinical postdoctoral fellowship at Vanderbilt University. She has expertise in the diagnostic evaluation of children with a range of developmental concerns. At Geisinger, Dr. Taylor conducts research and leads a variety of current research protocols with a focus on characterizing individuals with rare genetic conditions. Dr. Taylor has experience in engaging families and family-based organizations for rare genetic conditions in research through online participation that is offered internationally to patients and families. Let's give a warm virtual welcome to Dr. Taylor. Thank so you. Doc yeah. Dr. Taylor will be answering questions related to problem behaviors, education, early intervention, diagnosis of autism, sleep, feeding, toileting, and other behavioral interventions for individuals with neurodevelopmental disorders, which can include autism, epilepsy, intellectual disability, and more. We will be answering a combination of the questions submitted ahead of time and questions asked live. Thanks, Gabby, for that introduction. In brief, I want to start by mentioning for those of you who may not know, Simon Searchlight is an online international research program building an ever-growing natural history database, biorepository, and resource network of over 175 rare genetic neurodevelopmental disorders. By joining our community and sharing your experiences, you can contribute to a growing database used by scientists worldwide to advance the understanding of these conditions. Through online surveys and optional blood sample collection, we gather valuable information to improve lives and drive scientific progress. Families like yours are the key to making meaningful progress. You can learn more by visiting our website at simonsearchlight.org. Our team is here to help you along each step of the way, and you can contact them through our website too. Great. We will now start with questions. We may not be able to get to all of the questions today, but we will do our best. Some medical specific questions related to procedures and treatments or other topic outside of Dr. Taylor's expertise, we will not be able to be covered today. We will start with our first question. So our seven-year-old daughter doesn't know her own strengths and hits, kicks, and punches us frequently. She also self-harms, hits her head, headbutts, and we are concerned she is going to hurt herself or someone else. Sometimes this behavior is because of frustration with communication difficulties. Sometimes it's a sensory disturbance, and sometimes it's for attention. What do you recommend? It's a great question. So when kids are acting out, that's really, really difficult for parents to handle because they're handling a lot of different things. So you want to make sure that we're keeping our children safe. We want to make sure that we're keeping those around them safe from, from that aggression. But sometimes it's hard when there are multiple causes to the behavior. So that's really what you're, you're getting at is what's causing this behavior to happen. I think in these moments, it's important to remember that all behavior is a form of communication. So that, you know, getting your attention is not a bad thing. If your child your attention. We just need to make sure that we're teaching appropriate ways to engage in that behavior. So frustrate. So in terms of the first uh, uh, reason for the behavior, the frustrated due to communication difficulties, the first thing I would do is what, work with your speech pathologist to figure out where they're at right now and what do we need to be doing to get them where they need to be so that they have all the resources that they need to communicate well. Um, so this might mean that you need to participate in what's called an alternative and augmentative communication uh, evaluation or otherwise known as an AAC evaluation. This gives children alternate strategies other than words alone to communicate with 
uh, adults around them and sometimes even other children around them. This can take the form of a low tech intervention. So it could be that they have some pictures that they can use when they don't have the words uh, to communicate that they can hand to an adult or hand to someone else to try to have their needs met. Um, and it also can take a high tech form. So that might be like an iPad based or a tablet based app that they might use that they can access and then press different buttons in order to uh, say what they want when they don't have the words. So I think the first thing is making sure that we understand where their language level is. Um, and then in terms of uh, sensory is uh, sensory difficulties. So of course, trying to, to the extent that we can teach them an appropriate way to remove themselves or using an, an alternative strategy, like maybe having some noise canceling headphones, if noise seems to be particularly difficult to help them manage their environment as well. Um, and then uh, what, uh, Gabby, please remind me what the third, um, the third one was. Yeah, that sometimes it's for attention. Oh, for attention. So in that case, we want to try to teach alternate strategies um, for in, as a, as a way to get attention, uh, way to access attention. So wanting again, like I mentioned earlier, wanting an adult's attention is not a bad thing, but we need to teach children one how to act, how to access that appropriately. So it might be coming over and saying hi, mom, or hi, dad, um, I might be giving them a pat on that, whatever might be an appropriate way, or you think would be an appropriate way for them to do that, we need to make sure we're teaching them an alternate way. Because right now, what they know is that if they engage in that aggression, it's going to get a quick response, um, because we can't really ignore aggression. Um, so we need to try to teach them a way that we can, they can access our attention fairly easily without engaging in something that they know is just going to get it right away. That's a great answer. Thank you, Dr. Taylor. Our next question is, we have a three and a half year old son with 16P 11.2 deletion syndrome who communicates using sign language. He struggles with choice and is overwhelmed when it comes to picking a story, wearing certain clothes, choosing to play inside or outside, et cetera. And they usually result in a meltdown. How can we help stop suffering from his battle with choices? Either choice is usually perfectly fine, but the idea of picking one is painful for him. Uh, so actually at his age, I would say, you know, a lot of times with toddlers, we think about um, that we want to give them choices because it gets them a little bit of control of their environment. But your child with a developmental disability might be at an earlier stage of development where it is a little bit too much to, to offer a choice. So I think one, two things I would do is one, I would think about for the things where it doesn't really matter, or you think it's going to be fine, I would just direct him to appropriate clothes or appropriate activity. You might be able to reintroduce choices later on, but for some things, especially when I think about getting dressed in the morning and trying to get to school, if it's going to cause a tantrum, I think I would just pick his outfit out and then work on choices in the context of something where it's a little bit easier. And I would also limit the number of options that you present to him. So if you tell him, okay, you, you know, what snack do you want? And you give him five choices for a child who struggles with choices, that's probably going to be really, really difficult. Um, and I, so I would start with two choices. And you could even simplify it even more. Um, so he's not really making a choice about what he wants to do, but he's maybe making a choice about something like quantity. So if you think about snacks, like, okay, do you want one goldfish or do you want two goldfish? So it's a little bit of a different kind of choice, but it could be a good way to practice. So you're not making him decide between like cookies and goldfish. You're giving him a simplified version of a choice. And it's a good way to practice making choices without making it so disparate that he doesn't know what he wants to do. It might be that he kind of just wants to to do everything. And right now he just sort of needs your guidance to point him in the right direction. Over time developmentally, I think he might be able to get to that point. It just might be a slower process when, you know, whereas, you know, for a typically developing three-year-old, you might be presenting a lot of choices and that's very appropriate at their developmental level. But for a, a child who is behind, they might not be quite there yet. So I would try to limit choices. And if you are trying to introduce choices, make it at a time where it's not going to interrupt your day as much and make them very, very kind of simple choices. That's a great answer. Our next question is, my 19-year-old son has Kleefstra syndrome and is very high functioning, but has some developmental and social delays. He is known to bother the girls at school or other organization he's a part of to go out or be his girlfriend through phone calls, emails, texts, messaging apps. He sees a behavioral therapist and we, and we talk about this, but the compulsion never goes away. In this world of technology and social media, how do we help our kids navigate and be safe from themselves and others? 
That is very difficult, I think, across the board, and not just for individuals who have genetic syndromes or developmental disabilities. In terms of what's being talked about in therapy specifically, I'm not sure, but I do think that some social skills program is going to be programming is important for him, at least in the context of what's going on with his therapist, if not even some like group-based social skills programming about what is appropriate versus inappropriate behavior. Um, some of the tasks you might think about doing is writing down things things like that are very appropriate that of how he might be appropriately interacting with other people around him and inappropriate ways to interact with those people and actually have him him actually do it have him actually sort the tasks so is this an appropriate way to interact with somebody uh, with you know the other uh, girls that he's around or is that an inappropriate way and then possibly even having that if his, his therapist or any kind of mentor would go into the community with him to try to prompt him when those things are actually going on um that, that to know that that's inappropriate in that context um i also think that addressing the whatever us uh, i mean in the world of social media i think limiting social media access entirely until we get to a point where maybe he has a better understanding of this um, might be very appropriate to not allow those things to happen or keeping a good monitoring on it, um, making sure that uh, that, you know, you know who he might be texting um, in, you know, and potentially even blocking numbers uh, if 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 we don't want him to be contacting certain people or if it's been requested that he not contact certain people. The other thing that sometimes we have to teach our children who have some kind of social difficulties is that the way that you interact with one person is not the same as you might interact with another person. So I'm going to interact very differently with my family than I interact with my friends versus people who are my coworkers versus people I would consider to be acquaintances versus people who are complete strangers. And that can be a really difficult concept for those with social delays to understand. And so even within the context of what's inappropriate versus what is appropriate, you kind of have to boil it down to, to what are these different circles of social interaction that we have with our really helping uh, are those individuals understand so who falls within this this very small social circle of like the people that are closest to us and what might be appropriate with them and then expanding out I think it's also important to try to reinforce this with individuals and other individuals in the community who might be, they understand that he, he has a disability and those, so they might say, oh, it's okay, I understand, but it's actually not okay that he, you know, because it's causing problems down the road. So if there might be, you know, a, a, a female in the community who says, oh, it's okay, I understand he can hug me, I would actually tell that, that female, say, do not allow him to hug you because it's sending him mixed messages because if we're teaching him that this behavior is okay, Okay with certain individuals, but then this individual is not okay. And we're trying to teach these different circles of social interaction that just causes a lot of confusion. So sometimes it's also a little bit of a community intervention, where as his parent, you might actually say people like, we're trying to really work on this. So please, like the, the phrase that I use that um, I, is a something that I took from my very good um, uh, coworker who wrote a book on something called the McGinnis syndrome, we call it handshakes, not hugs. And so reinforcing that idea um, that, you know, we might, not necessarily, even though there might be someone who's near and dear to us in some ways, like, no, stop, handshakes, not hugs, trying to teach that concept of like personal space that might be appropriate for these broader social circles. That is uh, that, you know, we might, the, the acquaintances in the community, so the people that we kind of know, um, so really digging in on that and making sure that there are really clear boundaries and trying to reinforce those boundaries, not just with him, but making sure that the community is reinforcing those boundaries too. Absolutely. That's a great answer and definitely very relevant to our current world. My The next question, my son is 16 years old and has aggressive tendencies when upset, causing him to break glass, throw objects, and lash out. He did not behave this way before and nothing seems to help with these outbursts. What are ways to deflect these outbursts in an appropriate manner? So first of all, the first thing I know is his age. So there might be a part of puberty that's playing into this. Um, and sometimes we will see some of these things, more moodiness um, that's going on um, associated with that. I'm not, again, I'm not sure of what the developmental level is, but certainly if there are communication difficulties that might be playing into that because it gets a little, it's easier to access attention, may not have other ways to express how he's feeling. So if he's working with a speech pathologist or any other kind of social worker or counselor, if he doesn't have words to label his emotions and understand and feel his own emotions, that's another thing that I would be working on, being able to recognize emotions and also express those emotions in appropriate ways. Um, in terms of therapies uh, appropriate for this, 
The first thing you could think about trying is something called cognitive behavioral therapy. Typically around age 16, um, individuals are able to engage in what's called cognitive behavioral therapy. Now, developmentally, you need to be closer to be about age 10. So if he has significant delays, it's not going to be as effective. But around age, by, but certainly by age 16, if he's a little bit um, a little bit more closer to that developmental age, it's certainly would be considered to be an evidence-based practice. Um, and what cognitive behavioral therapy does is it starts to help you recognize how you feel before you start to have an outburst. So if you were getting cognitive behavioral therapy about outbursts, you might start, they would start to try to teach you about what are your cues that you know you're about to have an outburst? Like, does your chest get tight? Do you start to feel hot in the face? Those kinds of things. And then it helps give you the strategies to use when you start to realize the signs before the outburst actually happens. So what we see sometimes with these outbursts is that the outburst just happens, but there were all these things building up to it, but the individual just didn't realize that they were happening. So sometimes you as the parent can realize it's happened. You're like, oh no, my child's about to have a, an outburst. But at that point, by the time you're realizing it, it may already be too late to get that to come back down. So we need to try to teach the child how they can recognize that that outburst is about to happen and then give them the appropriate strategies to help kind of calm themselves back down, like deep breathing strategies, other things that we use in cognitive behavioral therapy before it gets to a full-blown outburst. There are potentially also medication options, not my area of expertise, so I won't get into specifics there, but certainly if it's getting to the point where there is significant like property destruction or, um, or a, a, you know, aggression, I would think about potentially talking to, if you have a developmental pediatrician or a psychiatrist that you might be working with, they might be able to help with, um, with medication to kind of calm down a little bit so that those outbursts don't come on as strong. That's a great response. Our next question is, my son is eight years old and has ASD, ADHD, along with a genetic change in the ASH1L gene. He struggles with focus and paying attention, especially around electronics. In fact, he doesn't talk to strangers, but when strangers have an electronic device in their hands, he has no problem approaching them. How can we work on, imp on improving his attention span and reinforcing the fact he shouldn't approach strangers? Okay, so I'll take that question in two parts. One, electronics, and then second, working on approaching strangers. Um, so for the first part of the question, I think the biggest thing is just trying to limit electronics to the extent that you can. So setting it up for a certain amount of time per day, you could even use it potentially as a reward for doing better the rest of the day. The other thing, the question I would ask is, when electronics are not around, what does your child choose to do? So a lot of our children with autism spectrum disorder have really limited range of interests, and they tend to get more limited over time. So the older the child gets, the less things they seem to be interested in. So by the time they get to adulthood, they may only have one or two interests. And at that point, the, the interests that they do have tend to be passive interests. So they tend to not involve other people and they tend to be like listening to music or watching videos on a tablet. That's what I would call a passive interest. So we want to make sure we're giving them adequate time to figure out other things that they're interested in. And it might take a little bit of legwork on the part of teachers and parents and other people in the house, try to figure out what those other interests might be other than the tablet. And really what we call that is building leisure life skills so that there's multiple things that the child's interested in. So I would, again, limit tablet time, potentially consider using it as a reward, and then try to start introducing other activities. And if when you, if and when you start to find other things that the child likes, what are some other things that are similar to that thing that the child might also like? So for example, if you find out, okay, let's try, today we're going to try bowling, and they seem to enjoy bowling. So, okay, what are some things about about bowling. So maybe they like activities that involve balls that have kind of a small group of people, but not a big group of people. And maybe there's some music in the background. It's a little bit of an environment like that. So what else might they enjoy that that would be like, well, we could try mini golf. That might be a game that involves a ball and it involves a small group of people. That one's outdoors though. So it just adds a little bit. So I would just keep trying to find something. And when you do find one, see how you can build on it and try to find similar activities. You might also think back on things that he may have enjoyed when he was younger that he kind of phased out and try to reintroduce them to kind of bring down the, the tablet 
uh, the tablet obsession a little bit to the extent that you can. Now, if he has kind of free access to tablet all the time right now, it might cause a tantrum at first. If you do this, you could think about doing a little bit of a ramp down um, as opposed to just saying, well, no more tablet. And then, you know, you kind of throw him off forever uh, or for the whole week or for the whole day. Um, try to ramp down the tablet time a little bit so you have it in a zone where it feels a little bit more comfortable. In terms of approaching strangers, the biggest thing I would do is just try to intervene immediately um, as best you can and making sure that we are, just like I talked about earlier, that we're teaching what inappropriate versus inappropriate behavior is. Your child might also need to have you help explain what a stranger is um, and is not. And you can even, again, do kind of a sorting task where you take pictures of people the child knows and then take you know, download pictures off the internet of people the child doesn't know and make sure that you're, you know, they understand like this is someone I know versus this is someone I don't know. Who can I approach versus who can I not approach and make sure that we're teaching those rules um, very, uh, very clearly. Absolutely. That's a great multifaceted response. Our next question is, I have a broader inquiry regarding parental dynamics and attachment concerns. In observing my child's behavior, I've noticed a distinct preference for one parent over the other especially noticeable during bedtime and nighttime waking. The preferred parent's presence seems crucial for a peaceful sleep. How can I navigate and address these attachment patterns to ensure a balanced and secure bond with both parents? That's a great question. And sometimes we do see this. I um, mean, even thinking about typically developing toddlers, sometimes they'll, you know, you'll or younger kids will say, like, I want mom or I want dad. And and it does sometimes vary back and forth. But our children who have some of neurodevelopmental disabilities, sometimes they get really particularly attached to routine. And so if you have one parent who is typically the bedtime routine parent, and that could be for a variety of reasons. It could be because the other parent works third shift and is not there, um, or you know, for morning routines that you know the other the other parent has already gone to work. And so the, the other parents doing uh, the, the routine. So I actually wouldn't think it necessarily is an attachment issue, but it could just be the way the routine has been. So I would think about trying to find opportunities to break up the routine. And by break up the routine, I don't just mean swap parents. I mean, are there opportunities where both parents could do it together so that they get that sense of that both parents are involved in this and then building that flexibility where then one parent can say, actually, you know, mom usually does this, but dad's doing it tonight, but they've done it together enough times. So some opportunities for this would be like on holidays, over weekends, you know, if there's coordinated work schedules at all, what are some routines where we can try to make it that mom and dad are doing this together so that it's not always falling on one parent or the other and trying to build that flexibility. And it could be too that, you know, if it's, for example, say it's a bedtime routine and the child always wants mom to do the whole bedtime routine, will they let dad be in the room? too. Like, so even if dad doesn't do any of the bedtime routine, he's just there, he's hanging out. Maybe he's sitting on the bed and listening to the book that you're reading. And then over time, then mom and dad are both in the room, but maybe dad reads a page or two of the book. So it might be a slow process to that if they've gotten really attached to say one parent doing a specific thing. Um, but I think you can kind of try to, if both parents are able to sort of work that together a little bit, trying to bring that other parent in and maybe fade the other parent out to the point where then you can maybe flip flop a little more seamlessly. Absolutely. That's a great answer. Next question. My nine-year-old son has OCNDS, ASD, and anxiety and has trouble with avoidance slash refusal around school. He seems to be in a fear or panic mode about going to school. The school seems to view it more as defiance that rewards and punishments can fix. But what are your thoughts on viewing this through the lens of a neurodevelopmental disorder? I think there's potentially a lot of things going on. Um, so the first thing I would want to know is, well, so... Well, I think there's a lot, there's, like I said, there's a lot of things going on. So there's first, there's just the act of getting to school itself, which sometimes the parent takes the child to school. Sometimes it's a bus. Sometimes that in and of itself can be problematic. So is there anything about the, the process of getting to school that's a problem? Like when does the panic start? Does it start in the house when you like are asking to put the backpack on? Are they refusing to get on the bus? Or is it the act of actually going into the school? And then you say the school is trying to think about fixing it with rewards and punishment. So I'm assuming that he's also having some behaviors at school that seem to be panicking him or like making him anxious. The first question I always have when there's behaviors related to school is, 
is the child's curriculum matching their level of development or where they're at academically? So when there's a mismatch between what they're capable of currently or uh, what they're capable of currently academically and what the school is demanding of them, that generally results in behavior problems for any child who's being um, challenged in a way that they're not ready to. So if your child's in the third grade, but they're reading at a first grade level and say doing math at a first grade level, most of their skills are much lower, but they're giving them third degree, uh, third grade work, there's going to be behavior problems. I can almost guarantee it, or they'll just withdraw from the classroom. You may also see that manifest as kind of panic and anxiety. There's all these demands being placed on that child that they are unable to meet. So my first question would be, can we review the IEP and make sure that what the school is asking the child to do on a day-to-day -day basis is actually reasonable for that child to do? Um, depending on their age, they might also have separation anxiety from a parent. So in typically developing kids, we usually see that around age four. Um, and that might be another, potentially another thing that, that could be going on if it is a parental separation kind of anxiety. Um, so that might be something to consider. Um, the biggest thing for a child who's experiencing anxiety is to not give into it. So if the school is calling and telling you to come pick him up, we don't, that's not the solution. Now there might be some, I wouldn't use punishments at all, um, but there might be some ways to kind of reinforce or encourage uh, your child that might be very appropriate to help him get a little bit more comfortable comfortable with school or help him make those baby steps where he starts to be more comfortable with his teachers. Um, but again, I would start by reviewing to make sure the coursework is appropriate and then see. Um, uh, and that's sort of how I think about that neurodevelopmental lens. It's not necessarily just behavior. There could be a lot of other things going on that are Im impacting how he's reacting to his school environment. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that response. How should we react to a seven-year-old child with intellectual disability who is masturbating? Great question. So the first thing is that I would redirect. Um, and the question I would have is where is the where is the individual masturbating? Are they masturbating in public? Is it happening at school or is it happening in the home? The biggest thing that we want to try to teach children is where it might be appropriate to engage in that behavior. So you think about what are public, again, I'm getting back to kind of a sorting task like I talked about earlier. What is a public behavior versus what is a private behavior? And so we might start to need to teach that with what is considered public and what's considered private. And so there are things other than masturbation that we would think potentially are private behaviors that can include showering, it could include just like dressing and undressing, but masturbation would fall into that private behavior category versus public public behavior. And then we need to help children differentiate what's a private environment versus what is a um, what is a public environment. When I think about private environments, I usually try to keep it very simple. The only place where it is truly private is when you are in your own home, in your bedroom, and the door is closed. Um, sometimes we'll say, okay, well, a bathroom is a private environment, but there are bathrooms everywhere. That is not clear enough indication of a private environment. So if we really need to boil it down to make it as simple as possible, in your bedroom, when you're alone, with your door closed, and that's the only acceptable place to be engaging in masturbation. And if it were to happen somewhere else, automatically redirecting that. If it were to happen somewhere else in the home, I would actually direct the child to the bedroom and close the door if they do not do that. If you're in the community, I would try to stop the behavior without calling as too much attention to it. If you call it too much attention to it, or if you might fuss or raise your voice, you may actually make the behavior worse. Um, so like to the extent that you can say no hands in pants, be very matter of fact about, about it. And then when you get home, you could potentially redirect them and say, now would be fine. Um, I, for them to engage in that behavior, but trying to stop the behavior if it's in a very inappropriate place in a matter of fact way. I know as a parent, that's really hard to kind of maintain that matter of factness, the extent that you can, that's important. Making sure the school knows that you're working on this too, um, so that they, you know, they know what the rules are, that it's, you know, because we don't want them deciding that it might be okay to masturbate in the, the bathroom at school, but again, um, at home, in your own bedroom with the door closed. Absolutely. So our next question, hi, my daughter is 16 in April and she has P-O-B-I-N-D-S slash epilepsy and now recently an AVM in her brain. She really suffers with her memory and struggles at school. Strangely, she can name any song or artist that comes on the radio, but quite often can't remember what she has done in her day. How can we help with her memory? Thank you. 
Great question. Um, so uh, sometimes we do see some of our kids with neurodevelopmental disabilities having extraordinary memories for things, especially things that they are particularly interested in, but having a really hard time with remembering things that um, that that are not that are not immediately present or that they're not particularly interested in. So I'm suspecting that some of her great memory is because she really loves music and she really likes current artists and that that's why she's able to do that memory for you. Um, but that in cases where it's something that she's less interested in or she's less engaged, it's harder for her to remember that. Um, so in terms of like when she, so I'm just thinking of a specific example where we might be able to intervene here. So she doesn't remember what she did during the day. So I would actually start working on ways where we can help her remember those things. So that might be that when she comes home from school, could her teachers give her give you prompts or clues to help her remember what she did? So that could be just little, maybe they take pictures of her throughout the day. I know that sometimes schools will take pictures of students doing different activities and text them to parents. You know, are they, or send them through like the school's app. What, like, what, what do you know about what she did that day so that you can help prompt her to remember. Now, similarly, if you're on sort of a special trip or vacation or doing something special over the weekend, trying to document it really, really well, and then help her kind of guide through that. So she kind of has a prompt about, about her memory. And then you can actually, if she really struggles with memory too, it might be useful for her to do that herself. So then once you kind of show her ways that she can help, help remember what she did, be that if she can take notes, she could take notes or she could take pictures. So you should kind of show her a memory skill, a way to help her remember and then help her learn how to do that herself. Absolutely. We are now going to move on to questions related to toy linen. So hi, Dr. Taylor. Thank you for being here. A four and a half year old boy with mild intellectual delays. And my question is about toy linen. We have tried a few things with absolutely no interest or uptake. How much should we push or do we just hold off for now and try again in a few months? That's a great question. I am always a proponent of potentially taking potty training breaks if it is really not going well, especially if you're getting to the point where you're creating a toileting aversion. So that is a risk of pushing too hard is that if you're trying to like force your child to sit on the potty and they're screaming, crying, and they won't sit at all. And they're just, everybody's just getting frustrated. In that case, I would absolutely say, let's take a break. Your child might not be developmentally ready yet to work on toilet training. Um, the other times is that there are some times of the year that are a little bit better for working on toileting than other. For example, the summer and holiday breaks. So if it's going on right now, then you can say, you're not taking too long of a break. It's just like, let's try again in June when the child's going to be home all the time. We're going to have maybe a little bit more leeway to actually influence the environment because when you're sending the child to school, if they're not also working at it at school, plus that's a different environment, you don't necessarily always know, you know, are they taking them on timed bathroom breaks? Probably only if it's in his IEP that, that or um, his in individualized education plan, his special education program, that they must take him on timed bathroom breaks. So, and if he's also struggling at school with it, it might just kind of be going nowhere. So if, it, if it's really going nowhere right now, I would not be opposed at all to saying, let's just wait a few months. June is right around the corner. It's not that far away in the grand scheme of things. Then we can maybe try again. In the meantime, though, it doesn't mean that there aren't some things that you could potentially be working on that are sort of pre-toileting skills, but it's not actually toilet training. So for example, will your child just like, are they okay just even being in a bathroom? Like, are they fine with that? Or is that a struggle? So even if you're not getting them to sit on the potty, just making sure that they're fine with bathrooms in general, making sure that they don't mind the sound of the toilet flushing. You know, are they good at washing their hands? Those are other things you can work on in the meantime. Um, when you're maybe taking a, a toilet training pause. But I think it's okay to take a break, especially if there's a lot of frustration on your part or the child's part. Absolutely. So our next question, our daughter has med 13L as well as ASD and intellectual disability and has been working on toileting with her ABA therapist. They are using a set schedule every 30 minutes with time sitting and doing well and understanding when she's on the toilet. However, she struggles to stay dry between sessions and doesn't have a sense of when she's had an accident. What is the next step? 
Okay, so they're using a method that we use pretty commonly, and it's 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 shown to be pretty effective. So in between her, be I'm I, I think I'm interpreting your question that in between the sessions where her therapist is working her with her really directly, so when it's at home, it's just she's not doing it at all. So one thing I would think about doing is replicating it at home. So you certainly can. Typically, what we do is we just give her give the child all the water, all the juice that they want, and we also work on it. Sometimes it's just going to take a lot longer for your child to get to the point of realizing that they um, making that connection between the urgency to go and actually taking themselves independently. So it sounds like you're at that first, so you're at that stage one where it's working really great as long as we take them on time bathroom breaks and we need to make that transition to, I realize I need to go and I either tell someone or I go to the potty by myself. So even if you're not working on the rapid training at home, you're not giving lots of juice, I would still think about taking on timed bathroom breaks. And in addition, taking her every time that she has an accident, because you really want to build that connection between I had an accident and I still have to sit on the potty. So it's both of those things working together um, in, in combination. And also if, um, and I'm not sure if you're working on bowel movements yet too, but potentially, you know, if you're having bowel accidents, you could do the same thing and um, have them have her sit on the potty as well when she has a bowel accident too. But hang in there. You're doing the right stuff. It's just going to probably take a little bit longer. And I know it's frustrating to not see that transition from what we call prompt dependency. So I all like, I always need a reminder to do it to being independent, but it that transition time might just be a little bit longer. So hang in there. Yeah, absolutely. That's a great response. Our next question, we are really struggling with toileting and bowel movements. Our child is nine with intellectual disability, very impulsive, but verbal. She gets incredibly anxious and refuses to poop on the toilet. She has been toilet trained to pee for years without having any issues, but she will hold her bowel movements until she goes in a diaper. When we have tried taking away the pull-up option, she has held it in and become very constipated. We've tried different toilet seats, et cetera, but do you have any recommendations on helping with potty training? Yes. Um, so uh, constipation is your number one enemy for bowel movement uh, training. Um, so if the constipation is not controlled or not well controlled, especially since she has a history of holding, um, you might want to make sure that she sees a pediatric gastroenterologist gastroenterologist to make sure that there's nothing medical going on that's either exacerbating the constipation or there might be some ongoing constipation that needs to be cleared up. Because as long as there's constipation, especially you mentioned that she's fearful, so it's probably painful when she's going and then, then she holds it and then she makes it worse. And so it also, after we take care of constipation, it takes a little bit of time for your bowels to actually go back to normal. Um, if, especially if you've been severely impacted. So we, we really need to make sure that her, that medically the constipation is managed. So working with um, a PEDS GI or with her pediatrician, depending on the level of severity, that can include anything from imaging and a clean out of her bowels. It could include um, daily medication like Miralax. The important thing to remember is that when you start a constipation regimen and you're giving medication for constipation, you need to make sure the child takes it every single day. So sometimes the reaction is, okay, well, the constipation is kind of cleared up. So I'm not going to give it anymore. And then you might just get constipation back again. So you kind of put yourself in this little bit of a loop. So the first thing I would do is make sure the constipation is completely under control. And then we can go back to working on the bowel movements. So the other thing that's going on here, I think potentially is that she's gotten really attached to the diaper or the pull up. And that happens sometimes too, is that that transition from pooping in a diaper or a pull-up to actually pooping on a potty can be really difficult for some children. So in this case, we recommend something that we call diaper fading, which is that we try to still give them that feeling of wearing a diaper or a pull-up without the pull-up actually being physically on their, per without the pull-up being totally on their person and they still actually poop in the potty. So what we do is we actually just cut a hole in the bottom. Now this does take a little bit of work on your part to create some pull-ups and diapers that have holes in them, um, but have her put the pull-up on and still sit on the potty and have the the bowel movement on the potty. You could also start by putting the pull-up on her and still having her sit on the potty without cutting the hole yet. So she gets used to that feeling of sitting on the potty and having a bowel movement, even though it's not actually in the potty uh, and then starting to cut the holes. And then you can make that hole kind of bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until there's kind of no pull-up left. Yeah, that's a super interesting method. Our next question is related to feeding issues. 
My 17 year old daughter who has the mind of a six or seven year old has trouble with night eating. She often wakes up multiple times at night and eats whatever is in the fridge, but doesn't remember in the morning. How can we help deal with this? So the first thing I would recommend is that she has a neuro neurology evaluation. Um, so a seven, that's an old, that, that's not a typical age for sleepwalking um, for one. And it's also not typical to eat and not remember it in the middle of the night. So we do have some kids who will get up with developmental disabilities who will get up in the middle of the night and kind of food forage, but they typically do remember. So the fact that she's getting up and essentially kind of sleepwalking and eating is not typical at all. So I would have her evaluated by a neurologist who could potentially complete uh, a sleep study if they think that might be indicated because there might be something going on with her sleep that we need to treat first. Um, if the sleep study is negative, again, we do sometimes have some behavioral food foraging. I would start locking cabinets and fridges as an intervention to start with. We do have some families that need to do that for children who are foraging at night. But the number one thing I would start with is a eval evaluation with a neurologist to see if she might have a, um, a sleep disorder. Absolutely. Going off of that, what would you recommend for kids who have a hard time focusing on mealtime activities, such as using cutlery to eat, but not looking at their plate? Yeah. Um, so I think the, I, the biggest thing I would think about doing there is trying to min minimize distractions. So sometimes when kids are little with, we like put a cartoon on for them or something so that they can, so that they'll actually sit at the table. Um, but then if that becomes a complete distraction, it doesn't really work. Um, so we might, if you are still using kind of that method where they won't sit unless you turn a cartoon on or a show on for them, I would let them watch it and then maybe like pause and be like, all right, we're going to take a couple bites and then we'll turn the show back on so that they have some time to actually pay attention to what they're doing. They practice using their cutlery. Um, if you're not using like a cartoon or distraction to get them to, to sit, I also would, you could think about like some structure for them um, to, to pay attention to the meals and make sure that they know where their fork is. Also fine motor skills play into this. They might need an adaptive fork or a fork that has a spoon that has like a, a, a loop around the wrist so that they can kind of keep it in their hand. That can be another piece, um, another piece of it. Yeah, absolutely. We are going to talk about sleeping issues now. We really struggle with bedtime for my eight-year-old son, and it frequently turns into a confrontational dynamic. We know how important sleep is for moderating his behavior issues the following day, but getting him to sleep at a reasonable time seems impossible. What techniques have you found to help parents help get their kids to sleep? So if I was in the room with you, I'd ask you a few questions. What time are you trying to put your kid down? How long does it take? Anything over, you know, well, really anything over 20, 30 minutes, I start to be pretty concerned. Um, and then are they sleeping through the night? Are they staying asleep through the night? What time are they getting up and are they taking naps? So those are the main things that I would want to know. Um, and in terms of like, if it sounds like you're having more problems on the front end where you just can't get the child to kind of calm. So the first thing that I would think about doing in terms of calming down down is we want to make sure that we're limiting screen time. So no more than 30 minutes of no, no more than no screens 30 minutes prior to bedtime. So that no TV, no tablet, nothing like that. So we're trying to create a very calm environment where we're not amping kids up. Some kids find bath time to be relaxing. Other kids don't. Uh, so making sure you know what side of the aisle your child falls on, whether our baths too exciting or our baths calming and making sure that we're really focusing on calming activities. Also making sure that there's a very clear routine can be helpful. So what do we do first? Do we brush our teeth first and then get in our pajamas and try and make sure that everybody is on that exact same routine and that the all adults or all caregivers are on that same routine. So it's really clear everything that's leading up to bedtime, maybe, you know, in, ending in a, you know, a, a, a good, a nice activity that's kind of fun, like reading a book, but something that's relatively calming. Um, if none of those things are working, you just kind of need to get the ball in your court. Um, you could, could potentially think about melatonin over the counter as an option. Um, usually the minimum dose is about 1.5 milligrams. If you're using anything less than that, it's probably not therapeutic. Um, if they're not falling asleep within about 30 minutes of you giving a dose of melatonin, it's not working. Um, depending on your child, you might be able to use a higher dose, um, but I would talk to your pediatrician before you actually make that decision about how, how high of a dose um, that you could potentially use just to kind of get the ball in your court while you work on building these routines. Once the child is doing pretty well, you could try stopping the melatonin in and see how things go if it seems like things are are going a little bit better. That's a great response. Thank you so much. 
We have a couple of questions related to speech and communication. My 16 year old also has severe speech apraxia and intellectual delay. Therefore, he is not able to express these emotions he's ex he experiences when he is upset. As a result, we are not able to predict when this is going to occur. How can we better address his unique communication and emotional needs? So the first thing, if, I mentioned this earlier, but if he hasn't had an alternative and augmentative communication evaluation, he absolutely needs one. Um, so if he has severe apraxia and he either is very difficult to understand or is potentially speaking very minimally verbal, if not not, uh, or very minimally verbal, then we need to have some other ways for him to communicate. Um, if he's not using a device at all, it's going to take a while to get to the point of being able to use things like emotion words, but those are a part of the system systems that we use. So even the, the low tech systems where we're doing card exchange, once kids g understand the system, they understand how it works. There are cards that we can introduce to help label emotions. That's also true for the iPad based devices. There are little um, picture cards that people can use to identify and label their, uh, the label their emotions. So I would start with the AAC evaluation if you're not there yet, um, and then work on emotions as part of that. If you already have an AAC device implemented, talk to your speech therapist about how you can work on emotions maybe in collaboration with a counselor. Absolutely. Our next question, how do we select the school path for a child with major speech delay? Is it helpful to postpone the school start for a year and maybe redo preschool to help speech develop? Also, the parents are considering a regular school class with inclusion or a separate smaller class with other children with various disorders. This is a really, really individualized question. The best person to help you answer it is a combination of your teacher and potentially the school psychologist um, who's embedded within um, embedded within the school. And your speech, your speech pathologist may also be helpful because it's not just the speech that's going on here. There's also where are their academics, where are their where's their social development. Sometimes speech alone is not necessarily a good enough reason to hold kids back, depending on the severity of the delay um, and also what else might be going on. There are some times where it is appropriate to hold a child back and that we might be able to kind of close that gap a little bit before they move on. Sometimes it also depends upon when your child's birthday is. Um, and that's sort of an artificial boundary that school systems draw for themselves. But is your child going to be much, much older or are they at the young end already? So if they were born in, say, August, um, and so they're going to be um, the at the younger end of their class anyway. It might be okay um, to 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 say that we're just going to wait um, that we're going to wait uh, and until they. Um, Sorry, I messed up my months a little bit there. Um, but if they're uh, yeah, if they're at the young end of their class, uh, it might be it might be more reasonable to just say it's not going to make a big difference for them down the road. But it's more a, more than just speech that I would consider for your second part of your question um, in terms of if it's appropriate for a general education or inclusion or what type of classroom they should go in. Again, that's a really individualized question. The way that I think about it is that I wouldn't want your child to be what we call a big fish in a little pond. So so we don't want them to be like the the top of their class. So if your child is speaking a little bit, um, but everybody else in their class is nonverbal, they don't have any peers to learn from. So I would probably think about how can we make sure that they're exposed to peers who are actually speaking better than them. And that might be better approached by putting them into more typical classroom or a classroom with more inclusion. So that's sort of how I think about it. Is you want your child to be kind of in a classroom that's very appropriate, but you also want them to be challenged a little bit, especially at younger ages, and having appropriate peer models at younger ages can be very important for learning. Absolutely. Our next question is, how can you help someone who is nonverbal with communication? I think we've touched on this a little bit, but I'll reiterate too that we want to think about um, alternative and augmentative communication means. Um, I think uh, alternative and augmented communication can also be sign language. I, I didn't I think I've mentioned that earlier as kind of a low tech option, but again, working with a speech pathologist, potentially one who specializes in this area, they can actually do an evaluation specifically for uh, a device to see what uh, what device seems to be the most appropriate for your child, um, and and have them and help you set it up or have this help them set this, this help this, have the school help uh, get it set up for them. Absolutely. So our next question is related to diagnosis. How do you determine the type of autism a child has and how can you learn to understand a child who is nonverbal? So kind of going off of that. 
So the way we think about type of autism now, so his, uh, quite a while ago now, um, there was a change in how we diagnosed autism. So we had kind of three different subtypes of autism. There was autistic disorder, um, there was um, Asperger's syndrome, and then there was something we called pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, or PDD-NOS, which is just a complete mouthful. Um, but over time, we've actually collapsed those three diagnoses into one single diagnosis that we call autism spectrum disorder. So um, really the hallmark of autism is sort of that delay in social development. And how we think about type of autism now is actually more level of support that the child needs. Um, so we would think about a child who does not need, doesn't need substantial support. So they have the core symptoms of autism, but they're fairly independent. Um, and then we have a level two, which would be more moderate. They might need a moderate level of support in their environment and then a level three which needs substantial support uh, in their environment um, to, in order to achieve day-to-day -day living, li um, living tasks. So I don't think of it now as sort of subtypes of autism but rather level of support. And Gabby, can you remind me of the second part of that question? Yeah, it's going off of what we talked about a little bit earlier with the last question, but how can you learn to understand a child who is nonverbal? Oh, okay. Yes. So again, um, I also, the other thing that I think we, we haven't discussed too, it, well, I've talked about it briefly at the very beginning, it's that behavior is communication. So paying really good attention to what their behaviors might be trying to tell you. So even if they don't have great ways to communicate with you with their words, they're probably trying to communicate to you to some extent with their actions. You might be able to realize things that they like and don't like just with their actions as a, one way to try to understand, but then also trying to give them the tools. Absolutely. Our next question is related to sensory issues. My 17 year old has STXBP1 as well as ASD. We deal with a lot of behavioral issues related to noise. She loves certain things to be loud like music, but hates door shutting, dishes being put away or our cat crying. An audiologist confirmed her hearing is fine and I was told that headphones could be helpful. What advice could you provide for getting her to tolerate these distracting noises? So certainly headphones can be helpful. Um, so they take um, an, a, like a sound that's very aversive to an individual and just at least mute it a little bit. So it's not as not as a not as strong. It's not as loud. So I know it can be confusing sometimes when there are some things that they like that are really loud and other things that may not be that loud, like a door just simply closing, not even being slammed. So that can be confusing. But it sounds like you've done a fairly fairly good job of identifying what those sounds are, and that's really the first step to helping her. Um, tolerate those other sounds. The, the cat one, I think, is probably going to be the biggest challenge because you can't control when the cat meows. Um, but you can kind of work a little bit on the doors closing. So if you get her a pair of headphones and you have, like you say, okay, we're going to practice. So what we call this is systematic desensitization. So you practice exposure to the sounds. One thing that's helpful is when you know a sound that you don't like is going, is about to happen, typically it makes it a little bit less aversive. Um, so you can practice, you know, with headphones on, oh, we're just going to practice closing a door. We don't want to do it over and over and over. We don't want to just make it worse, but we just want to get her to the point where maybe she can start to tolerate a little bit more. And if she wears headphones around the house and it makes her a little bit more comfortable, I think that's fine. Absolutely. Our next set of questions relate to support and resources. So how can I share my personal experiences with the Simon Searchlight Research Program and contribute to shaping insights for the benefit of future families? That's a great question. So we do have a way to share your story. I believe it's on our website um, that you can share your story, but you can also send us an email if you wanted to share some of your insights. Um, we're always happy to hear from our participants and we would love to hear about your experiences. Um, and thank you for being a part of our community. Yeah, abs absolutely. What can we do when there is no one in our area who knows about a particular genetic change? Research is great, but without help and support, it can make you feel hopeless. Yeah, so this is a really difficult challenge that a lot of our families face. Um, those It doesn't necessarily always matter if you're in a rural area or if you're in an urban area because the number of clinicians in the United States and sometimes even the world who know about your child's specific genetic condition can be limited. The first thing I would think about doing is actually, uh, if you got genetic testing done and you're still in contact with the genetic counselor who did your testing, they're often the best first step to find local resources in terms 
terms of clinicians who might be familiar with your child's condition. Um, if your child has a condition that has had some research on it, you might be able, there's a, a resource called Gene Reviews. It's freely available and it's designed for a clinic. It's designed really for doctors to understand a, a, a condition better that maybe is so rare they've never seen it before or they've only met a couple of, of patients who have it. I would recommend if, you're, if your condition does have a gene review, I would print it out and I would take it to your all the doctors that your child might see so they can better understand what are the medical issues that we're facing here, um, what are the things that we should be looking out for so that you can try to build that knowledge for them. For some genetic conditions, there are specialty centers. Those are, they tend to be um, somewhat more rare, but if you look for a like center of excellence and then type in the name of the genetic condition that you have, you depending on what condition you have, you might be able to find um, some clinicians who specialize in it. Again, I know that it's um, it's not perfect, but if you're also, if you're linked up with the genetics department, the geneticists that you worked with, that's really their job is to really familiarize themselves with a wide range of genetic conditions, know where to find the resources to better understand the condition and also keep themselves up to date on what we know about it. Absolutely. Those are all some great ideas. One of our final questions is the following. Our son is afraid of traveling to new places or anywhere with an indoor setting. How can we help him overcome this? So I would recommend the, what I, I call a practice trips. Um, so sometimes it's really difficult when you have to go somewhere and someone has an aversion to go to that place to try to take them. So for example, if you need to go to the grocery store, which would be an indoor environment, and you absolutely need something, it may not be the best time to bring him because if he has a tantrum or it doesn't go well, it's just it might just completely fall apart and then you leave that store without the thing that you need. But what can be helpful is say it's a weekend and you think, okay, now might be a good time to practice going somewhere that maybe he doesn't usually wanna go and you have time. You have kind of time to deal with the tantrum. You're in a good headspace where you can deal with it. Maybe there's another adult who can come with you and you're gonna practice and you don't need any, you don't need anything and you don't have to stay there that long. So you might say to him, we're gonna practice going to the store. We're gonna stay there for 10 seconds. We're just gonna walk in the doors and then we're gonna walk back out. That's all we're gonna do. And maybe that's the practice trip for the day is we're just giving him a little small dose of what it's like to be inside this new place and we leave right away. So for the example of the grocery store, maybe you go right when the grocery store opens because you know there's not going to be that many people there. If that might be a part of what's going on, you walk in, you walk by right back out, and we just had a good practice. And you might try to work on building that time up, but also giving him a warning about what's going to happen. Let him know, um, you know, you can use a, a, a intervention called a social story where you kind of read a book about what is this place going to look like? What might I hear to try to prep them as much as possible for what's going to happen? Now, of course, you can't avoid all indoor environments all the time. There are going to be some where it might be a little bit of a battle because he has to go and he doesn't have a choice. But the way that you can try to make those battles easier is by also introducing practice when it doesn't matter. Absolutely. Those are some great suggestions. So to conclude, a big thank you to everyone who joined our webinar and to those who posed questions. Your inquiries play a crucial role in shaping the information we provide to our community and enhance our understanding of how we can assist you better. Also, thank you to Dr. Taylor for sharing your expertise with the Simon Searchlight community. We appreciate all your knowledge on these diverse topics. If you want to learn more about Simon Searchlight, our research program, and how you can join, please visit our website at simonsearchlight.org, and you can always email our study coordinators at coordinator at simonsearchlight.org. They are available to help answer any questions that you may have, including some of those that weren't addressed today. We hope you all have a great day. Thank you so much. Thank you.